I'm recording. We're back. We're back. Uh, how's it going? It's going okay. How are you? I'm okay. It's sweltering. It's a hot one. It's a scorcher. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have air conditioning in my room yet, so I just draw my curtains all day long so it doesn't get like too warm like in there. Blistering, yeah. And it kind of works. Yeah, no, my room's seriously. like pitch black. <laughs> That's how my room is. I have like heavy blackout curtains. And yeah, it's the only way. My room is pitch black and sound free. It drowns is the Slayer out. poster still up in there? No, I'm going to put it, I'll, I'll put it up again. You'll put it in the baby's room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With like those like Celtics flags that Dan got. <laughs> I'm trying to turn my baby into the next Rick Rubin. Yeah. Um, his his Hell palette yeah. will only be like hip hop and heavy metal. Very cool. Yeah. I can't wait to see him in some crisp white t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> um lot on the docket today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty full one. It's also no so intended. interesting. <laughs> it's like a little bit well. Yeah, Demi Lovato. Yeah, this is my new strategy: is um, <laughs> fat shame one episode, and then walk back the fat shaming and issue an apology the next episode. Yeah, that, that should warfare. keep us going yeah. for a while. Yeah, and then do some mental illness shaming, mental illness stigma. Yeah. Sorry, and then <laughs> the next one we'll do um, ageism. Yeah. And ableism, just, yeah, always. Just like, yeah, like an avalanche of, yeah. That's, yeah, that sounds like a good format going forward. So Demi Lovato got some finger waves. Uh, she has like one of those flapper haircuts. Just kidding, that's not. <laughs> I thought you meant like people were waving their finger at no, her. No, no, no. Remember like the haircut that black chicks had in the 90s? Yeah. It was really cute, the finger waves. People need to bring that back. They have to. Um they have i've seen like the tool that's like a crimper yeah that's kind of like a squiggly one but it's like a big investment to make because i don't want to like it's a very special look to have like crimped hair yeah it is you know yeah it could go both ways it's not an everyday no everyday vibe no and you basically have to have kind of a little bit of poof or frizz for it to look good Mm -hmm. it can't be like sleek do you, that's my objection with like hair ads and commercials like the before always looks better because the girl has sort of like natural Nicole Kidman in the late 80s early 90s hair and then like tousled yeah and then like in the after she just looks like I don't know like an Albanian escort <laughs> at like with like crunchy curls yeah like at some lounge in Tirana it just like looks really bad always. yeah I don't like when my hair is too soft or glossy yeah it makes it less manageable yeah. i like a natural texture me too. <laughs> me too that's one of the things that i actually i wish always... we had something to advertise because this would be a great moment to do some spawn con but yeah. literally no one wants to send us endorse us yeah i guess we missed the um the freck moment i went to sephora no. and i saw like or i think freck didn't want us to do the ads oops <laughs> But we're going to do them anyway. <laughs> I think, yeah, they didn't want, I don't know. Maybe they just didn't want to pay us or they yeah. didn't, they underestimated the wide appeal of yeah. of our vocal fry podcast. But Frack for aging beauties who love to say the N word. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because I already, I'm getting age spots, but when I put freckles on, yeah. it looks like. It, they're all freckles yeah exactly i just apply it on my melasma like existing yeah and just make it like a little bit more um a distinct. little more popping yeah. exactly it's like you added like um you know like a contrast filter or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just like make myself look like that woman from behind the dumpster at <laughs> <laughs> who someone on the sub pointed out looks like um laura loomer she does yeah that's funny she does yeah that actress um it's a good product. Yeah. I'm going to keep using it even if they won't, they won't spawn, don't want our sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> totally. Anyway. But people should pay us to like disavow, like not use their product. Right. So that because they can so virtue signal. Exactly. Yeah. 
That's smart. That's yeah. like an interesting marketing strategy. Uh, like <laughs> girls, can you uh, uh, disavow L'Oreal, L'Oreal <laughs> Lancome juicy tubes or whatever? <laughs> Lancome probably doesn't even know I exist. Yeah, probably. And I've done a lot for the Juicy Tube brand and Starbucks. Like, yeah, I'm a vocal member of like the Green Straw Mafia. Yeah, you really. And I get nothing for it. On the map, (laughs) I did. And what did you get for it? Nothing. And I I just got tired. I I just got tired of seeing cake pops in my in my DMs. Yeah, Yeah, it's a nightmare. And I listen. I put the mullet back on the map. And what happens? My my fashion hero. Kim Jong Un bans it in North Korea. He does. Yeah, he banned the mullet in North Korea, and also skinny <laughs> jeans. Good for him. Yeah, I. I he's maybe if this, war on hipsters. If the Soviet Union had done that, maybe they'd still be around. Yeah, but they, possibly. Yeah. I mean, blue jeans were a big blue jeans. cultural moment. Jeansy. Blue jeans, white shirt, walk into the bar. <laughs> he make my eyes burn. They should have just executed all the stilagia who the soviet union like all the hipsters oh yeah i mean that's basically the kim jong-un method yeah exactly like what was the word she used stigade Stilagi. what are stilagi it's like a soviet con- they're like um what's the equivalent english like mods it's like a mm. stylish hipster people in the soviet union right who like wanted to go to mcdonald's and wear blue yeah. jeans yeah they and, like were, leather like, jackets at the forefront of like uh style and then like balenciaga took up that style much later but if they if they didn't exist i think like balenciaga wouldn't exist and we wouldn't have the the sweeping yeah cultural moment totally that we live in now anyway which is so exciting which is why there's so many great things to talk about on our yeah. on our docket today. like demi lovato <laughs> who's a person who um we've all heard of but still don't know what she does yeah. exactly she's a singer She's a singer, and I think she's one of, like, she probably does a lot of guest judging spots on various, like, vocal Mm. and voguing shows. I actually saw an ad for a show about voguing that Jamila Jamila is a judge on, and I think Demi Lovato is a judge on, I've seen the ad. They're friends. Yeah. Because Jamila came out in support of her when she spoke out against the frozen yogurt (laughs) store (laughs) in Los Angeles. (laughs) Because they're both Munchausen sufferers. Yeah. I'm going to read the Patrick Sandberg tweet. Yeah. Because I, Go this ahead. really resonated with a lot of people. I sent it around <clears throat> and I'll read it now on Demi Lovato. A bipolar, bicurious, self-harming, bulimic, bullying victim, alcoholic, cocaine-addicted, heroin junkie with ADHD, who is a pansexual, queer, non-binary, <laughs> and survivor of child abuse, childhood neglect, and rape, bedeviled by heart attacks and strokes legal blindness and brain damage <laughs> wait he fit all of that into a tweet that's sounds- and a and a real housewives gift that says true munchausen syndrome wow she's she's like the american jamila jamil no wonder they're friends of course they're friends anyway i was watching the kind of uh, ad for the show <laughs> and i was like wow not a single person on the show is without mental illness mm-hmm. this is like a rate my mental illness show <laughs> aka the voguing contest yeah yeah i mean you really can't like you can't gut voguing of all of its like coolness and expect anything to be left you know and hire two awfuls and i know that jamila jamil and demi lovato are all are both women of color bear with me but they are politically awful they are demi lovato is like what race is she <laughs> i think she, i'm gonna either go she's either um latinx or italian masquerading as latinx because i don't get a P- poc vibe from her i just assumed she was latina mm. but i don't know we can fact check this <laughs> is she also a gemini she's like on so many levels of crazy she's august 20th leo oh she was from mexico okay there you go I knew she was uh so yeah they're both they're both like WOC but they're actually awfuls like they're like so politically and culturally white mm-hmm. like who oh yeah she a, was like a child actress too yeah she's a Disney girl right? so she is yeah she's been through a lot but if you go on a, a Twitter tirade against a frozen yogurt company you are for all intents and purposes white 
just putting that out there. Of course. And completely unwell. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she came out as non-binary. I guess that's the story. And she mm-hmm. said she was proud of it. In March, 2021, Lovato came out as a, as pansexual and sexually fluid first. <laughs> This is now before coming out as non-binary. In March, she said, I've always known I was hella queer, but I have fully embraced it. This is like such an elaborate way of saying that she's fat. <laughs> it's like that scene in 30 Rock where uh, <sighs> the Alec Baldwin character is talking about uh, overeducated coastal hmm. elites and Liz Lemon is like, Jack, just say Jewish. You know, it's like that thing. <laughs> yeah. So she has eating disorders. She has drug addiction. She has other Mm -hmm. mental health issues. She suffered. She said bulimic bullying victim. I thought was wonderfully sad. Yeah. Beautiful. (laughs) She's had three strokes and a heart attack. Sorry. They have had three strokes and a heart attack when they were hospitalized for an overdose in 2018 and was also left with some brain damage. Okay. Uh, Clearly also undiagnosed Munchausen's. 100% yeah Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of that going around because probably of the medical industrial complex you know I think doctors are very reluctant to diagnose people with Munchausen who come in like you know complaining of like weird phantom symptoms and they can extract a lot of money for them by doing like unnecessary weird surgeries and procedures and testing and stuff yeah and it's really easy to just like keep going to doctors and being like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're like, you have a, a long COVID. Diet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just feel crazy if I don't get tons of attention all the time. Yeah. You've got to help me, doctor. <laughs> um, Maybe she you like, could amputate my arms. She should. She should. We should bring back that uh, mental disorder, hmm. which was kind of like. A and E briefly toyed with uh, bringing it to light back in the in the two thousand tens. Like uh, people who like uh, get off on amputating parts of their body. Oh, yeah. That's another kind of like extended Munchausen's kink that people have. Um, that feels like a different thing, but related. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all kind of like I mean, you really have to like up the ante, basically. Like you can't stop. I but know. yeah, she well, non-binary to- is kind of the f- the final frontier. Yeah. Well, I saw a really horrifying thing called na- now instead of like merely transitioning and swapping your genitals, there's something called nullification surgery, which I is like I saw that, which makes insane. you like smooth. Yeah. It turns you into like a Ken or Barbie doll with like They literally like castrate you yeah. or like so you shut. Yeah, I guess you you have to have like a, a hole, f- like Ew. a cloaca, like an all-purpose Ew. poop shoot. Yeah. That's where we're headed. Oh, that sucks. I know. <coughs> but like the crazy thing is, you know, I'm on my like I have an illich medical tip again, but the crazy thing is like these people think they're being radical and progressive when they're literally just marching with the tides of history because there's like, you know, Alex Jones is right and there's like so much chemicals in your water and your plastics yeah. that we're all being but nullified be- anyway. Exactly. Like we're in def- we're in a nullified era. I nullify my love. Um uh, Demi Lovato is also like one of these like very moist and leaky people. Like she has that Janice Soprano, like mm-hmm. perennial victim grifter, like yeah. disabled grifter vibe, you know? Yeah. I don't, the disabled grifter thing is I came across on the internet, this woman selling merch that literally said disabled grifter. And I was just like, <laughs> so you're like self-aware in, in what you're doing? And then I plagiarized the merch for our uh, spring for summer our, collection. For our new yeah. summer line. Um, but I feel like this type of person is nothing new and typically female. It's just mm-hmm. that they're, they've been empowered because yeah. of social media. That's what sucks about it. Yeah. And I was saying, well, Courtney Stodden, who we'll get to, yeah. also came out as non-binary recently. And like the cognitive dissonance of like looking at Courtney Stodden and then having to use they, them pronouns, which already are like just grammatically incredibly are inconvenient. And it does, it makes me feel like a hostage, you know, where like a very like incredibly female presenting person is, and I'm sure Demi Lovato is not going to like start to look more non-binary. Maybe she will. I, 
she's probably going to keep Damien like Lovato. presenting in the same way that she has been. Yeah. But we have to affirm her identity by like s- disrupting our syntax to refer to them as they thems. And we just, that's how, how it goes. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I, I feel like we've been on this tip for like the past few episodes, but it's like, yeah, these people, it's a hostage situation. They, again, they want everybody to change their natural and organic reaction to reality they want them to modify it or customize it to suit their kind of bottomless need for attention Mm -hmm. which like yeah i'm like jordan peterson i have a a a warbling kermit like voice and i (laughs) will respect your pronouns but like i will also call out the sheer madness of well it's one thing (laughs) i mean it's one thing to identify as trans or undergo any kind of transition even aesthetically Mm -hmm. and prefer to be called like a she yeah (laughs) versus or a he um he him she her you know but the non-binary thing is so just feels so it's so arbitrary and then it logically just produces another binary of being non-binary or cishet binary yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> and it's not it's not the same as like dead na- dead naming or like misgendering someone because mm-hmm. it's like it's just like run amok kind of yeah and basically yeah i think like i and anybody like who feels like it can now come out as non-binary it just like very literally hard. and i could do it you should <laughs> i don't want to i don't want people to call me a they them you should just like as a troll mm-hmm. they them i mean anyone could they and directed their first feature <laughs> <laughs> i mean in so many of like i f- i feel like twitter trans needs to be its own thing twitter trans yeah like it's when you're on twitter so much you become trans yeah no totally it's not it's not traditional trans no it's like a new one i understand and respect traditional trans and i have a hunch actually i don't have a hunch i have a good authority that like traditional trans people (laughs) think the twitter the twitter trans thing is total madness of and course everyone can see it for what it is but no one is allowed to, to like, say it yeah. yeah i mean listen i'll i'll say it i've said it before and i'll say it again mm. and i've said it before and i'll say it again I'll well we're it. allowed to say whatever we want yeah in the- totally but like again i did not believe the patriarchy was real until twitter trans people started bullying me <laughs> <laughs> like mm-hmm. are you kidding me lots of toxic guys on twitter yeah, i'll say that i'll say that much by the way toxic again, masculinity <laughs> no to- in- i i did not believe that toxic masculinity existed until it happened to me <laughs> my trauma <laughs> tell your story my Anna, victimhood. so valid i'm coming out as non-binary because i was bullied by they them on twitter i'm trying to get a book deal. <laughs> yeah. um but like okay but the thing with twitter <laughs> trans is again like the the point is not to pass as a woman they don't want that they want to be mm-hmm. in this kind of constant like the identity is yeah trans. it's not the right transitioning is not the goal yeah it's not to be a woman yeah it's to be like trans yeah and maybe i don't know it someone doesn't need to pass necessarily to be like a valid trans person and there yeah. probably is too much like emphasis within the trans community on passing but it doesn't change the fact that it's like i don't know yeah it's like a third non-binary twitter trans is like a third identity yeah that seems to correlate primarily with people who have like serious personality disorders yeah compounded by like online brain Mm -hmm. because i feel like if you were truly non-binary, like f- com- actually felt in an embodied way that you were like gender fluid or wanted mm-hmm. to live in some kind of like androgynous, ambiguous, gendered way, yeah. you wouldn't probably identify as non-binary because once again, it's like you wouldn't even, you'd ha- you have to kind of like not acknowledge the, the binary to truly be. Yeah you couldn't non you couldn't like you couldn't negatively tether your identity to an existing 
positive value. Positive, I don't mean good. I mean, yeah. just like, you know, exi- extant. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like something tells me also that non-binary is not the cure-all that Demi is looking for. I think she's going to find... It's not she's really going to have some other problem. She's going to have to. And it's like, you know, as usual, she's, you know, medicate self-medicating with more of the same of what it of what ails her mm-hmm. essentially you know attention yeah like she's she's fixing the problem by readministering the problem like the the issue is not that she suffers from repression aka a lack of options which is what she attributed her drug overdose to yeah it's that she suffers from self-expression which is like too many options mm-hmm. you know i mean she's probably legitimately very traumatized from her childhood and definitely has a lot of troubles but yeah as you said i don't think it's it's serving her to continually like amend her identity to make herself into more of some kind of display i mean my advice is uh, to these people is always the same instead of um manufacturing new traumas and identities you could just make some art Mm-hmm. Like, isn't that the best therapy? Yeah. Like, make a record about it. Yeah. Instead of, like, you know... Penning a tell-all. Yeah. Is she, well, is she... She's not penning a tell-all. Is she... That's no, she... Well, so she sold a TV show recently... Oh, about, about eating, eating disorders. Eating disorders. Yeah. Um, uh, and was in the news also relatively recently after she called out like a frozen yogurt place in LA. <laughs> <That story. laughs> um, I'll just read what she said. Um, finding it extremely hard to order froyo from at the big chill official when you have to walk past tons of sugar free cookies and other diet foods before you get to the counter. <laughs> Do better, please. So I think I'm going to have to make that hashtag a thing. I will be calling harmful messaging from brands or companies that perpetuate a society that not only enables but praises disordered eating. So she's mad that they this brand was perpetuating, quote, diet culture. Yeah. By like marketing their products as like uh, sugar free, sugar free or like weight well, loss. Well, so then they said... We're not diet vultures. We cater to all our customer needs for the past years. We're sorry you found this offensive. Um, explaining that they were like the dairy and sugar-free options were for like diabetics or vegans or, or like people with celiac disease. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how she's going to be mad at like a brand. And of course, Jamila Jamil stepped in on her side. Of course. But it's like, <laughs> how, I, so, yeah, go on. Uh, how am I? forced to i feel bad that i'm forced to defend a brand against these two like trauma vultures you know it's like i'm sorry if you're a recovering anorexic or bulimic like how about not setting foot inside of a frozen yogurt store that's probably not the best place for you to go if you're if you're still on shaky ground you know right if you're gonna be be (laughs) triggered yeah just like don't you know trigger don't auto trigger and then take it out on the rest of us um but yeah, I, I think like she, th- her problem is that she thinks like oversharing incessantly to anyone who will listen will bring her kind of like inner peace and clarity and it actually will do the opposite, mm-hmm. which is continually up the ante on the sort of like traumas and identities that she has to invent to stay in the public eye. Well, so that's basically what she, she then did. She responded again to the story <laughs> and said that her whole experience there was triggering an awful you can carry things for other people while also caring for another percentage of your customers who struggled, struggled daily just to even step foot in your store. Um, one of the deadliest mental illnesses, only second to opioid, spelled wrong, overdoses. Don't make excuses, just do better. Then she accused them of gaslighting her and posted a picture from their Instagram that included a sign that said... Um, that used like guilt free messaging, mm-hmm. which she said was the kind of the crux of why it was problematic for them to offer sugar free options and, and frame them as quote guilt free. Yeah. And that's when Jamila jumped in <laughs> <sighs> and said, um, 
she's just one of few celebrities reminding us to look out for mental illness. Definitely. <laughs> Guilt- totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's really getting the... Her and Jamila are really getting the word out on mental illness. Yeah. More than they need to. Guilt-free is diet culture terminology. We need to stop using that fucking term. We are so lucky to even have food. What in the name of shit and hell is there to feel guilty about that's a term of shame orthorexia is easy to slip into and is a fucking nightmare to crawl out of wait hold on what's orthorexia it's like when you're anorexic but you are obsessed with like health food okay like it's basically just another term for anorexia but it's like when you it's like healthy anorexia it's like it's like what i had in los angeles where i was like i'm like bread is toxic (laughs) i can't like eat sugar dairy like and you really like restrict but kind of based on this really like la kind of moon juice framework of like Uh you know um which people with Munchausen's also which also they totally do. Love to do, which actually makes you fat because if you eat like sugar free and fat free options, you actually end up gaining more weight. Is that true? Well, fat free definitely. If you eat skim stuff, yeah. Really? Why? Yeah, 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 because you your body needs fat, and it actually like if yeah. you eat lots of fat, you can. It's like the principle of the keto diet, like fat and protein mm-hmm. first. It's the carbs that it's the carbs that, that are bad, and the refined sugars and stuff like that. Like you should be eating like high fat stuff, like fish and avocados. That's actually how you stay thin. Hmm. Um, and you know, keeping your right. portions moderate. It's, it's, it's all about the small portions. Very. It's. I can't say it's easy, but it's very simple. Yeah, I like, think it is simple. It's not the hardest thing to figure out how to stay slim. Just hit the gym a little bit. Yeah, and like you don't have to do all that. Eat healthy things, stuff. and yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, some kale every once in a while. Yeah, I mean, get lots of color on your plate. I'm lucky because I my palate is very like i like eating like cabbage and like anchovies yeah Yeah. (laughs) like those are the foods i probably eat the most yeah yeah and i don't i do like froyo yeah it's i mean froyo is delicious but it's like also chock full of like weird like uh chemicals that are used to make drones and whatever what are you talking about like it just like has all like plastics and whatever in it I'm microplastics I'm, yeah I, I, i'm sure because it's not like i think like froyo is like probably not made from natural ingredients what are you talking about is it i'm sure yeah. like, all these, like you know when you go to like this is not a froyo story but when you go to like <laughs> um cold stone creamery i was gonna say stone cold yeah creamery, the ice cream tastes chemical it doesn't well i'm taste not talking natural. about your like baskin robin okay I'm talking about like I th- I'm sure the big chill is like probably a kind of like high price point, more refined. Like if you go to that place, um, it's called like Culture or something mm-hmm. on Broom Street. Yeah, by that spot Daphne where they sell um, biologic research project okay. <laughs> products. <laughs> Once again, not getting paid for any of this. Anyway, yeah. it's like a froze. It's like a Greek froyo place, and I'm pretty sure it's just like literally frozen yogurt. Yeah, that I would buy in New York, but I feel like the Big Chill is probably one of those places that like looks like that sugar. It's sugar candy store and like blasts reggaeton and is open 24 seven and has a lot of air conditioning. I was getting that vibe, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Well, I've actually worked at two frozen yogurt oh, wow, shops. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually kind of qualified to talk about it. Okay. I worked at like a Korean one in Las Vegas when like Pinkberry first popped off and there was uh-huh. kind of like a Froyo craze around 2008. Yeah. So I worked at a place called Tarte <laughs> <laughs> that hired like high school girls who wore tank tops that said Tarte. Yeah. And then when I moved to Berkeley, I worked at a place called Yogurt Harmony. Uh-huh. And something I learned is that there's very different like laws around like probiotics and dairy storage in okay. California and Nevada. And I'm sure it differs wildly by every state. And I think <laughs> like at yogurt harmony, we did just pour like, which is funny cause it was more of like a hippie yogurt uh-huh. place, but we would just pour these like pre-bought like boxes of like pre-mixed yogurt stuff that probably were full of like corn syrup and weird bullshit. Yeah. But I feel like if you go to like a nice, a nice like a one, high end, like a yeah. Gigi and Bella Hadid froyo place exactly yeah um we'll have to the, the i think we're 
both too we disinterested talk too in much this about topic Fro, to yeah. fact check whether the big chill i'm trying to find there is a high end or mid market frozen mar- uh, yogurt place <laughs> if anyone knows i can't even find their um their instagram anymore oh yeah it has like neon very like millennial branded yeah. but they're actually sh- sponsored by israel it's for like instagram people to go yeah, to so gotcha, it's probably yeah. schlock Anyway, I might get some Froyo later after, yeah, we, that after we're done. I might actually spot. too. I'm like, like, getting nice. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. This isn't this isn't exactly Demi's problem. It's like a problem of women being too empowered on the internet in general. You know? Yeah, they're definitely getting getting too much um, screen time. Yeah, and it's like, it's bad because, again, kind of the onus is on you to constantly tell your story. And if you're going to tell your story, that means your story has to be like riveting and interesting Mm -hmm. on some level. But we're all desensitized to like the normal amounts of trauma. The thing is, I'm convinced that people are programmed to forget Mm. our traumas. And not relive them. But once you introduce the idea that you can profiteer off of your traumas, people, you know, the little Edison bulb goes off in their heads. Well, I mean, it's one thing to forget or like repress your trauma. Yeah. And then it does like manifest itself in these, which is what's happening with Demi Lovato. I don't think she's like a mastermind. You know, I think she is like legitimately traumatized and unfortunately also has like munchausen's as a result of that yeah and it has effectively what's like a megaphone in her hand at all times exactly so she's but the way that to sort of i don't think forgetting your trauma is the goal i think it's sort of like accepting it and moving past it yeah yeah i'm not saying that it's good to repress but i think just most people are literally programmed to move on and and yeah like I wouldn't say work through, but to, to, you know, keep on trucking, keep it moving because like there's life to attend to. Mm -hmm. I think most people are not naturally inclined to draw out their trauma in the public eye, but now that it's become popular, I think like, well, I just especially like mimic one another. Yes. And there's no, I feel like we've talked about it, but there's like, I feel like there's no actual psychological evidence that telling your story and broadcasting your trauma publicly actually does help people. I think all of the evidence we have to that is like anecdotal. Yeah. And the loudest people advocating for that trauma management strategy are like women on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. Who, who frankly, like in kind of in the grand scheme of things are fairly fortunate because again they're like usually celebrities on twitter like um i have like a whole roundup like a lady gaga was like retreading her rape trauma um right and, and talking about how it caused a psychotic break mm-hmm. um aoc was trotting out her insurrection She's trauma she's gonna be talking about that for forever. forever she said it was like fighting in a war and, and now she's, <laughs> in, she's in therapy for that <laughs> Um, Oprah teamed up with Prince Harry, who's a Ugh. spiritual female, yeah. to um, do a show about mental health trauma. And he did like um, whatever that rapid eye movement therapy thing is, like on the show. He's like totally prostrating himself on the like, yeah, <laughs> wellness stage. Yeah, it's like insane. It's really pathetic. It's gross. Um, I thought like when you were like a a beautiful bpd bulimic like princess die that you just had gay sons not <laughs> bpd sons <laughs> but uh, but like um the only princess die was around to tell us about her trauma yeah totally um he, prince harry also had some headline about how Meghan markle uh told him that she didn't kill herself because she didn't want to leave him alone mm-hmm. Like, not that special. You get a new wife. Gaslighting. <laughs> yeah, it's like once crazy. again another instance of gaslighting. Um, Bella Hadid was talking about um, Palestine from like the luxurious confines of her father's real estate empire. I mean, well, she her is dad, Palestinian. She's I get Palestinian. It. He himself he posted an Instagram of like shedding her a dad? single tear. Yeah, wow, for cool. the people of Palestine, and it's like. <laughs> 
I, I actually understand the Hadiths because they, they literally are Palestinian, but like how many real estate deals with Israelis does that guy have? Because it's impossible not to have Israeli real estate deals I'd in be Beverly interested Hills. To know. I, I wanna know. Yeah. We're never gonna know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just like this whole trend of people constantly negotiating their trauma in public. I know. I just hate it. It feels bad and, and sticky and disingenuous. Yeah. Nobody likes this. Who's really profiting from it? Like slate.com? Yeah. Like what's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't like journalism is also in such bad shape that it's like the people you've been writing these clickbaity articles that seem to come out incessantly probably aren't like making tremendous profits on them anyway. Yeah, I can't imagine that it's that lucrative. That's why we need Donald Trump back in the White House so that the the media can sustain it. To talk about his trauma of having <laughs> the election robbed from him. Uh, I felt like I was being gaslit by the electoral body. <laughs> um, I do want Donald Trump back. I miss him. Me too. I just want some tweets. Or a podcast would be nice. I've said this before. He, is, he has like a site where he publishes his little musings every once in a while, but it's not the same. Yeah, no, it really is not the same without him. It just, it, it's literally opened up the kind of hell mouth to all these females running amok with their like personal no, victim stories. They were doing that during Before, that. but now there's nothing, there's no counterweight in the form of Donald Trump <laughs> insulting journalists <laughs> and politicians. Right. Um, they're just running unchecked yeah it's anyway speaking of trauma oh yeah uh, uh, Courtney Stodden yeah and Chrissy Teigen mm -hmm. um they <sighs> were fighting over their what happened with that Chrissy Teigen basically back in the day when when Courtney was like in 2007 right 11 i thought okay but somewhere around there yeah 2011 that sounds right so basically what happened courtney stodden who is like the tabloid child bride from yeah 10 years ago um has been sort of absorbed into the post britney documentary mm -hmm. referendum of slut shaming and like mistreating young female celebrities or in her case like literal tabloid freaks yeah um <laughs> she has also come out as non-binary and did an interview recently where she described that period of her life as obviously being an incredibly dark and challenging one because yeah. she legitimately was a child bride who had like um, a flashpoint spotlight in the media because everyone was really like grossed out and riveted by her weird Story, life yeah. yeah it was like um the real life version of american beauty yeah which was it, it was like much more decrepit and depressing really depressing yeah um uh and so now in the post britney documentary era uh -huh. <laughs> she uh is looking back on the a decade ago with like the hindsight and the terminology that we use now, which is like grooming and gaslighting uh -huh. <laughs> and um, bullying and trauma and all of that. And she said specifically that Chrissy Teigen was one of the, the female celebrities who were like mocking her for her freakish demeanor and disgusting relationship and telling her that she should, she should kill herself as did like Anderson Cooper on one of his little segments back then. She went on some, she did some like funnier die skit with Jason Alexander uh -huh. where she's wearing like a bikini and like they're sexualizing her and like they're not really they are making fun of her obviously but the I watched it and the tone of it is much more of that like Tim and Eric absurdism rather right. than it's uh what she makes it out to seem like you know they're kind of like they are exploiting her for her like freak factor, but they're definitely right. not like coveting her sexuality or like 
um because she yeah. doesn't look like a teenager and well, she that's didn't the then. other thing like the narrative breaks down a little bit like it's really interesting because she starts talking about yeah like being groomed and gaslit by doug hutchinson who was like a 50 year old like casting agent bit actor like alcoholic acting teacher, I think. Yeah. yeah um and i remember at the time like obviously this was a big story and everybody was absolutely horrified by it but um it's weird to kind of adopt like unthinkingly adopt this unexamined new language and apply it retroactively Mm -hmm. to your situation and the narrative is a little weird because again courtney stodden wasn't exactly what your typical 16 year old like abuse victim is which is like you know in the media they're framed as like a lolita or an ingenue she never read a 16 she looked like a porn star yeah I'm, uh, that's not like and even like though slut shame her, no but. and though of course like emotionally mentally she was very much like a teenager yeah she was exhibiting like agency in her self presentation and was seemed to have a kind of self-awareness of like an Anna Nicole Smith thing that right. she was that she was doing. Yeah, she was like she was like kind of in the grand tradition of like Anna Nicole Smith, Pam Anderson, like 90s bottle blondes. It was like that aesthetic, like leathery, chewed up, yeah, big hard tits. It wasn't like, you know, well they're real. Oh, they're, they're real. not hard. Well, she's got them She's probably had them augmented since, yeah. since, yeah. Um, and she talks about in this interview that she gave, was it the Daily Beast or something One like that? One of those. Um, I had to sign up for the fucking daily caller or whatever the daily, to, wire, the daily wire to read the <laughs> one we should have just split that fucking I subscription know, it was like but 99 cents i felt so bad because i feel like in the future somebody will find out somehow that we signed up for the I daily the wire same thought. And i like, had the same thought they want to read ben shapiro articles and i'm just like <laughs> no i think he's we, a corny dweeb but we were trying to read this candace owens article <laughs> that we had that was really i felt really swindled yeah me too when i got behind that paywall um, I, I actually like Candace Owens. I think she's like smart and feisty, but she's constantly disappointing because she does the kind of like Marxist leftist clickbait thing. And one of the premium, mm-hmm. I felt totally cucked because I was looking at the membership options and obviously I went for the cheapest ones. Yeah. But one of the premium ones gets you a free leftist tears mug. And I was like, you guys, this is like so embarrassing and cucked of you. I know. To do this like. Yeah. Her whole thing is like a gotcha routine that never, she doesn't really follow through on enough. Yeah and she like calls she essentially calls Chrissy Teigen a leftist which is hilarious yeah Yeah. she's just shooting from the hip truly Um, but yeah uh, Courtney Stodden talks about how her father wasn't present in her life um, and how he found out that he was uh, that she was seeing this guy who was even older than him um, and was totally like livid and threatened to call the cops. And meanwhile, the mother was supportive and open to seeing where it went because she and the father had a shaky marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, this is very typical and familiar, like parents using kids as a pawn in their own relationship dramas. Mm -hmm. Um, The mother, you know, trying to look progressive and open-minded essentially to spite, to get back at the father. Mm -hmm. Um, But and the father is like has an appropriate reaction but he's laying down the law a little too late you know Mm -hmm. so it's like i think she courtney stodden actually had a by the sound of it a pretty rough upbringing yeah definitely no she also is probably i believe legitimately traumatized from her like childhood i mean i think she and demi both read as molested as children to me i'm gonna Mm -hmm. go out on a limb and say that that you know molested to bpd pipeline yeah tale as old as time and i think like another thing that like we don't talk about and should raise awareness Mm -hmm. about is go off queen in in these (laughs) in these stories like the epstein and r kelly stories what gets lost often is that the mothers are acting as procuruses they are literally pimping their daughters out to these older men Mm -hmm. um because they're like living vicariously through them or they need the money or the combination of both. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think you know, that's unconscionable behavior. Yeah. And I think positively, I guess will become maybe less prominent. I think it was very much less examined in back our, in the day. Back in yeah. the day. Like it was seemed like a more, I don't know. Even, like, obviously everyone thought that 
the marriage was gross and wrong, but with her self presentation and everything and just the way that 60, well now, you know, now in this like revisionist era where like 22 year olds can't consent to sex, <laughs> like the thought of like a 16 year old getting married is like unconscionable. But the fact is like, not that like there should be child brides obviously, but for much of human existence, like people did marry and reproduce very early in their life when they were like the most fertile. Right. And were more kind of grounded and mature back then. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I don't think teenagers, it's, I don't even, I shouldn't even have to say this, but I don't think it's appropriate for a grown man to marry a teenager. Obviously. Yeah. Um, just that, Courtney Stodden did have agency in the situation. Yeah, I think that she was on some level, uh, kind of on some level, the unfortunate victim of her um, mother and her husband. But I also think that she, uh, uh, of all 16 year olds, was kind of wise beyond her years. And I think that she yeah. knew that she, what she was doing. Um, I get it. Like I remember being 16 and wearing like a tank top with no bra and short shorts to the mall. And I knew exactly what I was doing and what would happen. I think when you're 16, however, you don't anticipate or understand like the second order, the consequences. consequences yeah. yeah. That's what is kind of iffy in mm-hmm. your mind, but you absolutely at 16, uh, not all 16 year olds, but plenty of them, know that they want uh sexual sexual attention attention from men yeah (laughs) and specifically older men like it's not and i think like you know they're programmed that way yeah it's like this is this is the time when you are like in that transitional phase like entering into adulthood i mean And our culture is also very schizophrenic in that way and that it is basically a kind of like a febophilic culture. Yeah. That at the same time like vilifies the agency and desire of like underage actors, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean, again, she, you know, I remember like she had like, yeah, like the platinum blonde hair like a crispy tan the huge tits she literally she dressed like a 35 stripper, <laughs> she never even looked 16 yet. yeah and i say this again out of uh, in all sympathy as a person who's always looked 36 my whole life since mm-hmm. i hit puberty i'm not like knocking on courtney stodden beautiful girl no but op- highly developed upper right body. optically it would have been a very different situation if she looked like an underdeveloped like more on the spectrum of like prepubescent child who was getting married to some washed up actor. It was like the spectacle of it made sense because there were archetypal precedents, a la Anna Nicole Smith, et cetera, that like sort of that we could process and understand. Yeah. And so we didn't look at her husband as like a vicious pedophile. We looked at them both as this kind of like, sick sad union yeah yeah he he doesn't he doesn't read as a vicious pedophile he reads as a pathetic pedophile yeah (laughs) and an alcoholic (laughs) um but yeah i mean i guess it's it of course it's like a sad story but you know again like she was failed once by her mother and then a second time by like the media but what do you expect And, you know, I think she's, it sounds like she's landed on her feet. Like she, she's um, writing a memoir. She's recording an album and and releasing a cosmetics line and running an OnlyFans. An entrepreneur. Yeah. She's the the real girl boss, I guess. They. They. They, yeah. We're going to have to edit this whole thing. Yeah, we're going to have to. (laughs) I'm just going to slip. I'm going to record us saying they. 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 And superimpose it on every time we say she. Yeah. Um. And, you know, the reaction with people like this from, like, shrieking girls and gays is always like, yes, queen, Um, because she's, like, a social media and reality TV legend, like somebody like Farrah Abraham or Black China. And that's always really sad to me because it's, like, elevating and empowering these, like, deeply troubled people. Yeah. That should get well before they have a platform. I mean, Farrah Abraham is a 
incredible outsider artist she is, in her yeah, own right she put out that album that was, cool, that was yeah. like really weird <laughs> um but yeah we just can't though i wonder if fair abraham will have a redemption arc in the same way that the I'm telling you, this all started with the with the Free Britney documentary. Yeah, totally. It's like now we're like, ooh, look at look at this disgusting David Letterman interview where he flirts with a young starlet. Yeah. And like remember how we gawked at these like freaks <laughs> yeah. in the early aughts and like now they need their like freakish. It's the same sort of cycle though. Like Courtney Stodden totally. is still a freak. We're just like talking about her trauma with like gravity now rather than like pointing and yeah, laughing moral sensitivity exactly um it's yeah i mean it's ridiculous and back in the day um you know all these people like anderson cooper and joy behar dr drew dr drew um all these people were allowed to be themselves in that they were you know craven bullies yeah and who were now, reacting naturally to like a spectacle yeah and now they have to pretend to be like uh, woke anti-bullies i'm gonna quote um armenian legend shant misrabian again because he has like the best tweet about this um the reason why so many extremely woke people turn out to have been bigoted in the past is because bigotry used to be the best way to bully and intimidate people but now performative anti-bigotry is the best way to bully and intimidate <laughs> people an evolving tool set for sociopaths very well said yeah i mean and that's the thing it's like chrissy Teigen is mm-hmm. I don't think Chrissy Teigen, by the way, is even like a, a lost BPD Munchausen's mom. I think she's actually just like a sociopath. Yeah, she's worse. <laughs> yeah, somehow. <laughs> um, it's funny because I saw a really funny tweet that was like, um, how did like the two worst women in history get their boyfriends to write such beautiful love songs for them in reference to like Jamila Jamil and Chrissy <laughs> Teigen? <laughs> Um, but she, yeah, so she's she's now under fire because she cyber bullied cyber bullied Courtney Stodden back in the day, right? And told her to take a dirt nap, and allegedly also DM'd her and would tell her that told she hopes she dies herself, and yeah. stuff when she was clearly threatened by her supple big natties. Yeah. Um, and clearly has a very weak, uh, insecure constitution that accounts for her entire personality. So it really comes as no surprise. I mean, it's legitimately, you know, regardless of what you think of Courtney Stodden, it's legitimately weird to DM a 16 year old and tell them to go kill themselves. <laughs> Definitely. Well, so she, um, issued an apology. It's her most recent tweet. <clears throat> And there was something in it that was so um, demented, actually. She said, not a lot of people are lucky enough to be held accountable for all their past bullshit in front of the entire world. <laughs> I'm mortified and sad at who I used to be. I was an insecure, attention-seeking troll. I am ashamed and completely embarrassed at my behavior. But that I have tried to con connect with Courtney privately. But since I publicly fueled all this, I want to also publicly apologize. I'm so sorry, Courtney. I hope you can heal now knowing how deeply sorry I am and i'm so sorry i let you guys down i will forever work on being better than i was 10 years ago one year ago six months ago <laughs> um and then she went on it's nothing compared to how i made courtney feel i have worked so hard to give you guys joy and be beloved and the feeling of letting you down is nearly unbearable truly that was where i was like you've worked so hard to be beloved that's such a creepy thing to work hard for that's like that's your whole problem chrissy yeah you're like a void <laughs> who wants to be beloved like who, would, who wants to be beloved no one who's actually beloved like i don't know like uh well, that's one of the most repulsive qualities in a person is like to like want desperate to be, to be yeah. beloved like no not a single person who's actually beloved has actually worked to be beloved they kind of organically became that way um you know, for like John Waters mm -hmm. or Lana Del Rey or I mean, or well, Donald Trump. <laughs> well, in the case of like Lana and John Waters, even, you know, I don't think anyone is. I think people become they seem more universally beloved later in their in life. But like John Waters faced a lot of trials and yeah. tribulations. You know, he was like lambasted over the course of his career. And he was definitely not like, yeah, uh, 
darling his entire life no of course i mean it takes time you basically slowly get more and more beloved as you get older well i don't think it's gonna happen for chrissy teigen no i mean she's i think like karmically a, she won't be won't be beloved that's I mean, how you really be beloved is by like cultivating good karma yeah and being like starting and loving yourself being being a good friend to people and like a a good relative and whatever Well, that's what i mean by karma yeah Yeah, you like what you put forth comes back towards you i mean listen i'm not again i'm like in in my very zen state and i'm not trying to be harsh but this is a woman who basically like documented her miscarriage i remember that that was i mean that's really awful and horrifying yeah like there are certain things that are not only private but sacred that you do not reveal about yourself yeah and it's just like a weird you know and she has a lot to like or you can like once again sort of there's a dignified way to like say you're late in your life and you're penning a memoir yes you know like you it's not a, just about like total repression or like non-disclosure it's like there's opportunity there's like classy ways to talk about things to yeah, talk about sure. things and like right posting on instagram just isn't isn't one of them and never will be yeah like w- providing photo evidence of your miscarriage um it's i, I love how donald trump called tegan john legend's filthy mouth why <laughs> That's pretty mild for him. Definitely. I think That's basically really, a compliment. Sounds like he was flirting with her. A friend of the pod, Antonio, once said that her face looked like a human whoopee cushion. It's She's had really bad fillers. Yeah. But why does she need fillers? She's already kind of like plump. I think she's had fillers for, oh, for a long time. A long time. She okay. like started too early and that accounts for the facial like bloating and stuff. They really like went to her head. <laughs> um, uh so candace owens then wrote an article called why i launched a campaign against chrissy Teigen. it's yes. time to make the left play by its own rules she started the hashtag surviving chrissy Teigen to sort of yeah. raise awareness about her long long record of of being a, a bully yeah being like a garden variety schoolyard bully on social media which is like <laughs> Okay. she left remember when she left twitter like recently like a month ago yeah and then I, like came back like yeah. that's really the worst <laughs> yeah she couldn't hack it um i mean like again she has a lot to take stock of like she has a husband who seems to love her yeah. shockingly enough she has three beautiful children i think three yeah or two she has more than one yeah she's got kids she has like, a nice life she, she shouldn't a, even be on twitter rich yeah she's a model in extreme bold face and scare quotes but (laughs) she is like that's a lot of stuff to be happy about yeah she doesn't really her manager should tell her to stop shit posting honestly yeah it seems like there's no one looking out looking out for her it just like it feels like these women a lot of them are just kind of like aimless on twitter and don't have a lot going on and are probably like bored and dissatisfied and that's what it feels like yeah and they need the dopamine of like being being beloved yeah exactly unlike us they don't have a podcast it's really easy they're let out it's really easy but also like the candace owens thing is is totally weird too because her whole kind of like clickbait shtick is um kind of coming down on leftists and Mm -hmm. like liberal culture but it's like you're launching a campaign that's the most like left liberal thing to do well in it like a leftist yeah in in it she says like this isn't like this isn't cancel culture it's consequence culture which is bullshit she's just obfuscating what she's what she's trying to do which is annoying yeah what did she call it she she called it um yeah consequence culture and accountability culture i'm like a big old no to that this sounds boring yeah it's more of like this sounds like another kind of awful ass ploy to like rectify things the hypocrisy is just you know too transparent to to even reckon with well yeah but i think candace owens is even smarter than these hoes because she's trying to sell something to you on top of it A, a daily what's yeah. it called daily wire daily like, wire subscription. Shapiro's outlet 
I'm gonna forget to unsubscribe. I know me it. too. And I then know I'm gonna, gonna get a four <laughs> month charge next month, and I'm gonna be like, "What the fuck?" So I guess we're gonna have to start reading the the Daily Wire to make yeah. it worth our our investment. It we really could have just one of us could have some. I know, up, but I know. I don't okay. know why that didn't occur to me. I didn't even put it on our business account. Oh shit! We should do that from now. We need to we're do so that more. <laughs> yeah. We're like not good business people. No. Um. Anyway. <laughs> what else is going on should we talk about ufos, UFOs. or geriatric millennials um i have to pee and then we can talk okay, about ufos yeah. okay cool we're back <laughs> we're back again um ufos ufos yeah um ufos have been in the news lately <laughs> uh U.S. intelligence agencies are expected to deliver a report on unidentified aerial phenomena to Congress next month, sparking renewed interest and speculation into how the government has handled sightings of mysterious flying objects and if there's any worldly explanation for them. So that reads like the NBC News kind of like primer on what's happening with UFOs. Uh Um and there's been some like leaked naval kind of footage of some grainy like blips and like floating triangles and stuff. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, everything is, they are UFOs because a UFO is all, all UFOs is like an unidentified flying object. But then Barack Obama um, has been going on like late night talk shows yeah. and kind of like coyly being like, well, we don't know. I'm not at liberty to say blah, blah, blah. Ugh. And then Joe Biden also, when he gets, he got asked at a, at a press conference recently about UFOs and he also made this weird cavalier dismissive comment. Uh-huh. Um, and then Harry Reid, former Nevadan senator, uh-huh. <laughs> who I'm personally attached to, uh, because he was the senator when I was like, a kid and he was one of the first like government officials yeah. I like learned about <laughs> <laughs> um, he wrote uh, an article in the New York Times um, about um, sort of like where he's for their what I believe series which I guess is like an op-ed series that they do um, and he said basically that he's like always been interested in UFOs and thinks they're like curious and merit investigation Uh um and that he kind of distances himself from like conspiratorial people who believe in extraterrestrials by making this kind of like blanket appeal to like trusting the science yeah like little green men like crackpots who buy into the yeah they're like they're the ufo discourse is really distinguishing itself from like those crazy people who think like aliens are real and like what is going to kind of come to light in this congressional info session about ufos which will be inevitably i think some kind of like horrible psyop that we're gonna have to read about and participate in yeah i think I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I think the UFO discourse is like unspeakably gay and corny. And I hate that it's back in the news and people are like talking well, about it. Well, it's very, yeah, it's different from previous iterations. Yeah. Well, because in we that it's even, taking on this like scientific yeah. jargon. Yeah. Rather than mm, what bothers me. I'll get whatever. They're really trying to. Um, redeem science for us but yeah i guess there were some u.s navy videos that were leaked and then declassified but yeah if you want to go off the other thing is like ufos don't necessarily they're just unidentified they're not necessarily extraterrestrial right they're not flying saucers that's just kind of a i don't know a, a failing of of language to to refer to what people are actually talking about this is like from the NBC story. Which is um, why Barack Obama and stuff can be like, well, we don't know what they are because it's like yeah, right by nature of what they are, they are unidentified. Once they're identified, they cease to be UFOs. Yeah. And I don't know, the most sort of logical explanation or like common knowledge around <laughs> my reality is that they're like 
Air Force or like CIA. There's like experimental kind of like Air Force things happening um, um, and the branches of like intelligence and government are too separate for there to be trans- total transparency between them. Yeah, I think like at worst they are like foreign drones doing intelligence gathering in a low risk way that doesn't compromise like living pilots Mm -hmm. um which is why all these like officials and politicians keep talking about this as a matter of national security i mean drones are like pussies they all they come in different shapes and sizes right (laughs) like there's not like yeah they're not all like the kind of like drones that like uh puerto rican dudes fly by the the pier you know and i mean all of the like footage and uh videos and stills that we're dealing with are, is, is like extremely grainy very easy to manufacture and doctor and like yeah there's no you know it's like the moon landing <laughs> no i know and they're like oh these, these like we're just supposed to be like oh my god look it's moving erratically and blinking weirdly yeah and like we're su- we're supposed to hear barack obama do the um if i tell you i'm gonna have to kill you like spiel <laughs> cock eyebrow bullshit sh- leo spiel and then be like okay well if they don't know what they are they must be from outer space or whatever um but but it, the I think yes, foreign drones, but also the CIA doesn't have to tell the military right. what they're doing or when they do it. So they're like experimental aviation, probably also drones, probably like, you know, they may or may not be foreign. I mean, do you believe in aliens? Um, yes. I, well, I think it's absolutely inevitable or like highly probable at least that of course because we exist there are other similar intelligent life forms in other galaxies yeah but so if, yeah i do uh, in that on that level so to me this whole ufo stuff if i can put my tinfoil hat yeah. on for a second go off um <laughs> <laughs> really feels like it's more like frankly satanic like trust the science propaganda that we've already been inundated with for the last like year basically well, yeah, they're trying to uh, recuperate the low standing of science after the but pandemic i think science has very high standing like look i mean amongst certain you know libtards, yeah. libtards like who are like in love with their like vaccines and stuff like yeah science doesn't necessarily need to be redeemed i think they're like upping the ante on like well they're manufacturing consent for uh for what though for for whatever fauci and his pals are trying to do in the future yeah i think yeah um and basically i think i've gone on like anti-scientific screeds on the pod before but to me it really comes down to like i do think it's satanic because it deals with a material realm exclusively mm-hmm. and like science and medicine obviously are valuable and have a place mm-hmm. and like I respect scientists mm-hmm. and like the scientific method to a degree but I also think that science is obviously completely fallible and corruptible and often dovetails with corporate and state interests mm-hmm. and so whenever someone instructs you basically the way Harry Reid is doing to kind of like blindly trust the science yeah that you should be skeptical and especially with something like ufos because i think when you're kind of like winking at like extraterrestrial life or something like beyond our like earthly realm Mm -hmm. you are dealing with something metaphysical Mm -hmm. you know like i don't think i don't think aliens are like little green men i think it's like there are other like dimensions of reality and there's stuff that's going on. That's that's metaphysical that can't be measured by the scientific method, which deals purely with like base measurements and like operationalizes reality into this really rigid and completely fallible system that doesn't account for so much of what reality is actually composed of. Yeah. You know, like we, the base reality that we can see and measure, I think is like, five percent of like what's really going on yeah it's like scratching the surface yeah that's true and i also think that like there's no way to vet certain scientific claims in part because kind of the 
illusory or artificial monopoly on authority doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. There's too many sources of information, many of which are in conflict with each other. Right. So there's no way to, to prove or disprove any of these claims. And I think like, yeah, this becomes kind of like a top down conspiracy theory to compete with the more frankly, realistic and sympathetic conspiracy theories man being manufactured from the bottom up that right. that deal with more material problems i think on some level um so but, whatever like comes to light in this congressional hearing i am already incredibly wary of yeah the congressional hear- hearing seems like a means of like manufacturing a novel distraction too that's also incredibly plausible like that's yeah. kind of what it feels like um it's interesting also that UFOs are now being referred to as UAPs or unidentified aerial phenomenon. It's kind of like how STDs became STIs at some point and we yeah, just like kind of went along with it. Go with it. Um, and the, I read the Harry Reid piece and it was like very like aw shucks and wonderment filled. You know, when I was a little boy growing up in a box car in and my brothel. bed was a bed, it was, it was um, a bale of hay or something, yeah. whatever he's talking about. Um, <laughs> Who, me? I didn't have a On science education. On the brothel education. floor, I used to look out at the stars. Yeah, and that that to me felt very, yeah, like manufacturing consent. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's another, like, the soft male version of, like, empathy politics where we're supposed to empathize with his, like, woe and is me, like, Huckleberry Finn-ass tale of growing up. <laughs> uh, robbed yeah. of a scientific education. Right. Well, Nevada does have a very poor school system, famously. No, That's I mean, why I I'm so that, stupid. But <laughs> <laughs> um, like this to me was peak Biden speak. This mm-hmm. is from his article. It has always troubled me that I have no background in science. We didn't have a science teacher in my elementary school. And there were limited courses available when I got to high school. But bec- but despite my lack of scientific knowledge, or perhaps because of it, I have long been deeply inquisitive. Why does the sun stay hot? I wondered. This sounds like Hunter Biden wrote it for yeah. his memoir. As Einstein says, curiosity yeah. has its own reasons. Um, right. He says later... Um, this is a conclusion of the piece. Spoiler alert. I believe it's crucial to lead with the science when studying UFOs. Focusing on little green men or conspiracy theories won't get us far. Of course, whatever the science tells us, some portion of the public will continue to believe in the reality of otherworldly UFOs as a matter of faith. So that's just smearing the deplorables who believe Once again, in little green men. Or just like any alternative to whatever the party line is going to be on ufos like it's already saying like it's really important that we trust the science and whatever the scientists say yeah if you think it might be another way or that there might be other dimensions to it yeah then um actually the the trick to understanding ufos and entering into this new dimension is getting the covid vaccine (laughs) it'll just put you on another plane of scientific reality right he says ultimately the ufo debate can be broken down into a sincere belief in science versus a sincere belief in extraterrestrials i side with science yeah that like never trust somebody who who um very sus claims to side with science um and then he says i believe that there is information uncovered by the government's covert investigations into an unidentified aerial phenomenon that can be disclosed to the public without harming our national security the american people deserve to know more and hopefully they will soon with the release of a comprehensive government report also i can't never wait trust. to read a comprehensive government report about what's really going on yeah that literally no one but mike tracy will read you know <laughs> and i'm just like never trust anybody who who is a official and claims that the public deserves to know more because it is their job to make sure that you don't know more and when mm-hmm. they go on record that you know exactly they, as much as they want you to yeah. know and when they go on record with all this kind of like uplifting positive uh democracy dies in darkness transparency bullshit they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes mm-hmm. i think like all kind of um uh kind of underserved by the way, do you know anything about this Harry Reid guy? Is his woe is me like? I'm sure tale? he's is from Nevada. <laughs> You're and sure he's like, from even if he's exaggerating, I'm sure his upbringing wasn't like fantastic. But like all these kind. But of, I like, don't know. No, I just was remember like being literally in, in like 
elementary and junior high school and being like, Harry Reid's the senator and he, he's the majority Senate leader. And like, no, he nev- we had like Nevada pride that Harry Reid was like Senate majority leader because he was like <laughs> in the news kind of a lot. And we were like, oh yeah, that's, that's our senator. Yeah, that guy seems cool. Like, <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't think I'm sure of like what he says about his childhood and stuff is, I mean, it could be the kind of thing where like when he was like, eight they moved to pennsylvania yeah. and he you know <laughs> who knows whatever but all these like all american kind of hard scrabble guys who are like men of the people they're very clever little yokels it's like Bill i remember he, he was responsible for the dream act okay which allowed like undocumented immigrants to um stay in i see okay. in the country if they met some like says i don't know maybe some like state testing quota or something yeah. i could be completely wrong if they met an older man who was an alcoholic <laughs> who was willing to, who is well them. to marry them yeah <laughs> um but no i don't really know a ton now, obviously now he's just writing like op-eds for the times so he's yeah just like a consent manufacturer yeah um but i think i think that you're absolutely right that this is designed to like if not recuperate, then consolidate like the stranglehold of science on the hearts and minds of libtards. Yeah. Yeah. By, by also like this um, kind of like second order operation of smearing like QAnons and deplorables and stuff like that. Yeah. Or religious people. Yeah. Cause they believe in like little green they men have faith. and like stupid bullshit. Or yeah. like the little green men, I think also is like a, um, like a red herring or something for I don't know the there being like a an alien extraterrestrial dimension that is um I mean metaphysical really is the only like word for it that like is like that deals with more esoteric yeah. kind of less legitimate aspects of quote scientific consensus or reality like Mm -hmm. Who, I mean, I don't fucking know. We don't know, and nobody's going to tell us. Yeah. Pedophilia and, and racism are okay in the other dimension. <laughs> That's what they don't want us to know. Yeah. And we'll never know because we are just limited as, like, human beings, like, in what we can even understand. So if there are extraterrestrial beings, they probably have completely different, like, consciousness structures and, yeah. like ways of of inhabiting earthly worldly reality yeah like some some aliens will come to earth and they'll think that like i want to hear what joe rogan has to say about this honestly this i think is he's one that i would it. this is one that i would tune into for of, of his program he he did a podcast on this right he must have it he, seems think, very up his alley yeah like I can see him like doing shrooms and then like talking about UFOs Going for four in, um, and a half hours. Well, he goes into um, sensory deprivation chambers, mm. and ha- he has a voice activated tape recorder. Okay, um, like taped to like the ceiling of it, and so when he he goes in them and then like shouts out his great his great thoughts. Wow, what a what a trippy guy. <laughs> I I'm I'd be into trying something like that. Yeah. It, it sounds interesting. Could be a good business expenditure. Yeah, <laughs> we could put it on our an ISO tank. Card, yeah, yeah. Um, just like go insane and have a mental <laughs> breakdown. My trauma. We did it for the pod. I think like how ha- an an alien in- invasion would be cool because it would force like the human race to like band together as a single species mm-hmm. and stop like pecking at each other's spleens and manufacturing like new gay little categories to like hate each other for. I mean, I bet if there was like alien contact that it would be, I don't bet. I'm not like, a, <laughs> I'm not a betting gal myself, but I could conceive sort of, in a sci-fi way of like there being alien contact and them preferring maybe to communicate even with like dolphins or something or like yeah species that have like sonar or something exactly that's like out of the realm of human perception they just activate the octopi <laughs> what's, what's that like octopuses octopi, oh yeah right? yeah yeah like multiple yeah sorry i was trying to the sound squids because octopi are very smart yeah they're very intelligent i think that they have like I think they're as intelligent as pigs or something. 
It would be cool if the aliens came down and like activated pigs and octopi to take their revenge on humankind for that chopping cool. them up and eating them. I feel like the the um if aliens came they would be they would come from a world where like Twitter trans was the majority. <laughs> And normies were like the minority freaks. They'd be know? even more woke. Yeah. And they would cancel planet Earth. Yeah. <laughs> for being problematic. Uh, <laughs> green lives matter. Um, that's all I had about aliens. About yeah, aliens. We, I mean, we can talk about geriatric millennials. Yeah. Or we can really call it quits. It's up to you. Um... I think we've we've done con- a lot of content, but you know, I have just one real take on the geriatric yeah, millennial that. thing was, which was um, a medium post that someone wrote about how geriatric millennials, meaning millennials who were born in the early eighties, who are kind of like Gen X E cuspers, yeah, are real assets in the workplace because they are able to pick up on social cues, unlike mm. like later. M- millennials and zoomers who are like too autistic to function yeah. in a workplace um and that they sort of bridge the, like the digital and the analog blah 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 it was full of lots of like weird corporate jargon that was boring to me yeah she's one of these like workplace consultant slash thought leader people just yeah total non-speak um but then the new york post published an article about the the twitter backlash to the term geriatric millennial mm-hmm. which people the article said people found it offensive, but then all of the tweets that they sort of cherry picked to illustrate their point seemed like to be in jest or kind of like, like they were joking. Um, but obviously geriatric as in like geriatric pregnancy does trigger people. Yeah. And make them feel bad because it sounds bad. Well, yeah. Geriatric pregnancy is a, long-standing medical term that they've now PC'd to advanced maternal age, which somehow sounds even more insulting, I think. But geriatric millennial is like an arbitrary, like made up category of people. Of ju- it just means older. Born. That's what geriatric means. Yeah. It means like aged older. Yeah. I'm, I'm both a geriatric millennial and geriatrically pregnant or I was, <laughs> but you like, you're I, technically i guess yeah you i'm were actually the, technically i'm on the cusp i actually don't know if my pregnancy was technically I'm, a geriatric pregnancy thir- I, I think they raise the age actually also for geriatric pregnancies well as i understand it's 35 onward but i conceived when i was 34 i think they so, raised it to i was told by like another 30 something friend of mine that they raised the age uh-huh to what to like 40 or something to 40. Yeah, just to well, make 40 it 40 is like the age warm. when it gets really dicey in terms You're of unadvisable. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like, you know, the, your risk of like abnormalities and complications mm-hmm. skyrockets. I don't know. I mean, again, these are like all rough guides depending on the person. Totally. Yeah. But I, I, I don't, understand why people are offended by the term geriatric pregnancy well it's my just a, hot take yeah is that geriatric is a lot like the word retarded mm-hmm. in that it sounds bad yeah and offensive because of like existing stigmas around aging and disability Being mentally disabled disability no that's like that's why people are like ooh, don't say retarded and it's yeah. like ooh, don't say geriatric. It's like, no, those are like descriptive words. Uh And the fact that they like trigger you and make you feel offended is because you, they're value neutral. Yeah, they are totally. Um, But people place their own like negative connotations on them because to them being retarded or geriatric. Yeah, always. It has, is, is, is a negative. Yeah, to me, none of these things are negative as somebody who's both geriatric and retarded. (laughs) like guess what we're all a little mentally impaired and we're all growing old like, there's literally nothing you can do about there's nothing you can do old. about it yeah. there's nothing insulting or shameful about growing older or being about using just descriptive terminology for like obviously you could use any word in a cruel hurtful way but yeah. the words themselves are value neutral and don't don't have the connotations if there wasn't already the existing stigmas surrounding them. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like if we were in a 
society that respected its elders people yeah. would love to be geriatric totally yeah <laughs> like, but like god bless this like s- spurgy neoliberal workplace consultant lady for she's like the james demore of women she didn't realize <laughs> that it would a shit storm this would unleash and also like you know the the irony of of writing a blog post like arguing that actually millennials are not obsolete to the workforce when they like very clearly yeah are. it's like it's you know, sweet of her to it's really sweet that she was pretend. trying to um convince herself primarily that she wasn't totally useless it's like lady she's like i know how to take down take a message when yeah. someone calls me on the phone i'm not afraid of voicemail <laughs> but I can text too. I can use bitmoji and it's like <laughs> I think uh, only boomers use bitmojis right definitely um but by the way you're useless and obsolete not because you're a geriatric millennial but because you're a thought leader slash workplace consultant because yeah. you have a totally fake and gay made up email job because you've invested in in this kind of workplace culture that's ceasing to exist yeah and that's like awful and toxic um anyway (laughs) um i'm i'm proud to be a non-binary geriatric millennial (laughs) pansexual bulimic retarded (laughs) see you in hell